The alternation of thinning, clear-cutting and replanting sets the tempo in this forest operation. Without constant human attention, the forest is vulnerable. Left to its own devices, disaster ensues. 1949, the war had forced tree farmers off their land and few had returned. The forest was cluttered with dead wood and undergrowth. That summer was particularly dry, and the people here today remember what ensued. The fire destroyed nearly half the forest and claimed 82 lives. But the lesson wasn't lost, and 60 years later, the Lond Forest is considered a model in firefighting tactics. Our mission is to cut the right flank of the fire and put out the tip, okay? Firemen train every day in order to be prepared. Dozens of watchtowers have been built, and 500 strategically placed wells provide firefighters with the water they need. The concerted action of public authorities and foresters has created 28,000 kilometers of trails that firefighters use on practically a daily basis. Since the system has been in place, the number of fires has dropped considerably. The tree farmers themselves formed an association and helped us set up the forest trails which are strategic for us because they let us get right inside the forest to each plot. So they helped us set this up and also the forest wells which provide water for our fire trucks and let us fight fires more effectively. The results obtained by the close cooperation between silviculturists and firefighters prove it's possible to solve the complex problems a forest the size of the land presents. The special feature of our southwest technique is that it is based on the topography of the forest that allows us to penetrate right into it. The forest is relatively maintained and relatively flat, so the trucks can drive through the undergrowth. They can go where the fire is, unlike other forest fighting techniques, notably in the southeast, where the topography forces you to wait for the fire on trails and paths and try to stop it at those spots. These innovative measures have come just in time, considering that today, global warming has increased periods of drought. Since its creation, the forest has never been at such a high risk of fire. But although fire can be managed by human intervention, there's another foe no one can do anything about. Wind. In just two decades, the forest has suffered four catastrophic windstorms. The most violent, Cyclone Klaus, blasted across the land on January the 24th, 2009. Some gusts were close to 200 kilometers per hour. The consequences were tragic. 12 casualties and nearly 400,000 hectares of forest destroyed. The destructive power of the wind was multiplied by another factor, the dampness of the ground in winter. In soil softened by rain, the wind toppled the trees one on top of the other and they fell like dominoes. For the silviculturists of the land, January the 24th, 2009 was an electroshock that raised a crucial question. Was the storm a meteorological oddity or a sign of things to come? Each time Jean Juillon returns to a plot of land which still hasn't been replanted, he recalls that terrible night where he nearly lost everything. One morning, I was making the rounds of this plot and saw the results of Klaus. We lost nearly two hectares of pines that were on the ground. 
We were devastated when we saw the trees down, broken. It was a sight we'd never seen, a war scene. A peculiar sight that's hard to accept. We didn't know what to do, whether we should continue our operation like before. At first, I had doubts. Since the storm of 2009, all the land foresters have had doubts. In a future where the devastation caused by storms will become more and more frequent, is the land forest sustainable? <laughs> 